So we just posted our first assignments, which is a fantasy landscape. Now we're going to post our next assignment. And we're going to go to unit modules, we're going to go to unit 5, but this is also a good time to show you what this assignments link is on our uh, homepage. It will give you kind of a shortcut to all the assignments, and it will give you a little bit of, of outside information. So for instance, I like to show this. This was from um, a student's final presentation a few semesters back, and they they presented on a, a concept artist named R.J. Palmer. And R.J. Palmer works as a creature designer. So with digital painting and compositing, he creates creatures for, for movies, for video games. And why I like to introduce it is because he does a lot of fantasy creature design. And he's a big fan of Pokemon. And then he's one of the more notable concept artists that try to do realistic versions of Pokemon. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing with this project. You can do any fantasy creature you want, but we're going to be compositing it from real photographs and trying to make it look believable. He was also the lead designer for, for Detective Pikachu to translate those designs into a, a live action environment, right? His main advice, <laughs> this is why I show it, this is from one of his tutorials, right? Is you got to organize your stuff. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. So for this class, that means organizing your assignments and all of your different resources. So we just posted assignment one. I want to make sure I put that JPEG into assignment one and that I have a PSD and a JPEG for the assignment. And I have all my references and I have my inspirations and I just have it all in one place. Now we're going to start assignment two. So I'm going to start a new folder. And I say that because some people are, are losing their files. It's important to always name your files with your name so we can find them if they get lost. Organization really matters. You can't be a dependable professional without it. So instead of going through assignments, we'll go through unit modules. We'll do like the whole rigmarole of introducing it. And this is called the creature concept unit. We're still compositing. But this time we're doing a sketch of the fantasy creature we have in mind. Maybe it's based off of Pokemon. Maybe it's based off another video game character. Maybe it's based off Greek mythology. Maybe it's just based on you want to see what a light bulb looks like with googly eyes and wings. We're going to post our sketch and we're going to work from that at the beginning of next class, just like we did sketches for our landscape for assignment one. We're going to have a question of the day that goes with this unit. That question of the day is about copyright. So you need to go back and read chapter two from our course outline if you haven't. That's the only required reading. And then the other deliverable is going to be assignment two. So here's that question of the day. What responsibilities and rights does an artist have when using compositing found images? For example, legal boundaries, artistic integrity, the, root to, the right to communicate a personal vision. Chapter two of the reading will clarify considerably. We're gonna, this is a nice little video that talks about the history of copyright and Disney's influence on it. This is a nice graphic, reminds you of all the different variations of Creative Commons that are out there. And we'll discuss that after the deadline. This is due on the 25th of September. So you have some time to read that chapter and to post at least 100 words. You need more than 100 words on the topic in order to get full credit. All right. Here we go, a little GIF animation for you. So creature collage. How do you make a fantasy creature? The truth is there is no fantasy creature in fiction or in media that is not some amalgamation of other things that are, already exist. Even if it's an electricity monster, right? It's still electricity. <laughs> so you figure out how to show that through images in reality of electricity. So here, this is a weird little creature, but it's a combination of bat ears, lizard eyes, I think it's actually chameleon eyes, a pig nose, a bear cub's like shoulders, I think it's a raccoon's hands or a gerbil's hands. It's got an armadillo stomach, it's got duck. I was gonna use duck feet, I think I ended up using something else. Crocodile tail, you know, on and on and on. We composite these things. This one's made all out of mushrooms. I just wanted to limit myself that way. 
but it's not as believable in the joints. So in order to make them believable, these sketches actually have to show the what's called the skeletal template. And that's what you need to try to sketch. And if you want videos of me sketching, all you have to do is look for assignment two. in our playlist and you'll see right like how to sketch for it so how do we get started you might already have an idea of what kind of creature you want to create but if you don't have an idea i'll give you some help pick a pokemon right you can even just pick it from this one image <laughs> because what's nice about pokemon designs you don't need to know anything about them, but you can tell what they are just by their silhouette. If they're small and cute, if they're big and threatening, if they're bird-based or mammal-based or plant-based, right? You can see it all just through their silhouette. We want our original creatures to be similar, similarly engaging and versatile, so that you all need to have unique silhouettes. So if anyone just composes something that's just a floating eyeball, doesn't work to be an engaging, engaging creature design because its silhouette doesn't tell us what it is. So its shadow needs to communicate what it is. That's a hallmark of, of concept design. So this student did a really nice job thinking about their sketch. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do this. So they chose these this Pokemon to base it on. And what they did was to try to understand the anatomy of that Pokemon. So... To do my example, I'm going to look up a, a POCA database. I think I used to have it linked to it, but I think they're always changing. So I'm just going to look up a Pokedex. And then I'm going to show you how I sketch based on it. And I'm going to go from the newest ones, because you'll see their, their designs have gotten... Their designs have gotten sloppier and sloppier. And I'm thinking of what my setting is, kind of my gothic thing. And I'm thinking some sort of owl might be fun. So... I haven't even seen any of these. <laughs> these might be from like the newest DLC. This one's actually really nice. All right, so I'm going to use this one just as inspiration. So I'm going to open that in a new tab, and I'm going to do a screenshot of it. It's how I'm going to understand my sketch, because. It, it's helpful to look at something to understand the anatomy. And why I like the Pokédex is, is if you think of it just, if you squint and think of it just as a black shape, it already communicates what the creature is. So it's very clear. It's a very clear form. So I did a screen grab of it. Now you're going to do this in your sketchbook. I'm going to do it digitally just so you can see. I'm going to just bring this in shrink it down, and this sketch is going to be what I work on before next class. Now this is what's going to be hard for some of you, but no matter, just like sketching for the landscape is difficult, remember for the landscape I said this was your sketchbook. This is the binding of your sketchbook. You want to compose your landscape into rectangles on a page like this, instead of filling up the page. For this, you don't need your rectangles. What you need is to just not take up a whole lot of room, but you're going to draw a circle. That circle is what's called the cranium. So I'll change the color so you can see that. The cranium is where the brain is. <laughs> it's the bone fishbowl around the brain. You need the cranium shape first, and then you need a spine. So what is the spine doing? You can just trace it, and then you can draw it. So I'm going to have my spine doing something like that. Then you need a rib cage. It's a lot of bone. You can decide whether you're doing a dragon, whether you're doing a griffin, whether you're doing a pegasus. You can find these forms in the skeleton. 
Okay, that's going to connect the neck. The, the neck is going to connect the cranium and the rib cage. On the rib cage, you have something called a collarbone, which connects two shoulder joints. Okay, I want you to draw both of them, even if you don't see it in the picture. The joint is there. Then, following the spine down, you're going to go into some hips. On a bird, the hips are tucked up and low, just like that. And then you have hip joints the same way. See it? The hips are contained in a pelvis shape. So I'm going to draw little circles for the joints. And then you have the legs. The legs might have backward bending knees like this for a bird. Or they might have forward bending knees like more humanoid. So I'm just going to draw those. So one, the leg in front is going forward like so. This is what's called drawing with basic shapes. It's not easy, but it's not anything to do with refined finished drawing. So everyone can do this. You just have to pay attention to the placement of these basic shapes, like circles, triangles. Now there's the wing. The wing has a joint here, has a joint here, and then it feathers out like this, like a human hand. Right? So then I can try to match that. Now, I've done my skeletal template. The only thing I'm missing is what's called the mandible. And on a bird creature, the mandible is a beak. That's the jaw that attaches to the cranium. So if this is my creature, I can do another wing out here. Now I can think, what kind of references do I want to look up for this? And those references come after your sketch. So obviously, this looks like a heron. So that's one sort of reference. But what else? What can I make it a little bit more interesting? Maybe an albatross. Maybe a pterodactyl, though it's hard to find photographs of those. Um, but sometimes you can get really good dinosaur reference from toys that have been photographed well. Other ideas. Maybe a, a crocodile that has that really narrow snout. I think they're called caimans. I don't think I'm spelling it right. Put a type of alligator or crocodile mouth. And I might say I want that for the mouth. Um, I might want kind of a lizard thing for the neck. So I might make little notes. What do I want for the chest? Maybe a polar bear? It's hard to get upright chests. You need like things that stand upright sometimes, like polar bears. <laughs> bears do that more than other creatures, so you can find more photos of that. For the legs, maybe something kind of elegant and long legs that are powerful. Uh, think about it. A heron? Yeah, like a heron. But you don't want to pull too much from the same sources, right? So I can look like flamingo. So giraffe legs could be different. We could try, absolutely. So now I have enough things to start looking up. Next class, I'll bring that reference and my sketch, and we'll start like fitting it in. Because you want your sketch to inform your reference, so that you're looking not only for the creature, but you're looking at it from the right angle as well. All right, that's what we're doing for next class.